Today, we will learn and reflect on slavery and the abolitionists in the years leading up to the Civil War, using the Yale Lectures on Black History and Civil War as our main source. Yale University has published the undergraduate class lectures for Professors Holloway and Professor Blight. These are over four dozen lectures in total. We took the best stories from the lectures to encourage you to listen to the full sets of lectures. They are spellbinding. And these were such violent times, and slavery itself was prone to such cruelties, that these videos actually have a disclaimer for those who have difficulty handling this violence. At the end of our talk, we'll discuss the sources used for this video. Also, you can follow along in our PowerPoint script uploaded to SlideShare. Please, we welcome interesting questions in the comments. Let us learn and reflect together. The history of slavery and abolition in the years leading up to the Civil War was a bloody history. Many whites did not see blacks as real people, and white masters saw their black slaves like they were talking livestock. And whites often refused to treat even free blacks with dignity as equals. And there's been an effort to whitewash and revise this history, to pretend that the slaves were well treated and happy, that slavery was the condition best suited for them, and that the Civil War was fought over states' rights rather than slavery. So we will try to tell this history with stories showing how American blacks, both free and enslaved, were real people with dreams, and innocent people who suffered from the many miscarriages of justice. Perhaps this objective is a bit chaotic. Famed historian Eric Foner once got a call from a reporter who asked, Professor Foner, when did all this revisionism begin? And Foner said, probably with Herodotus. And then the reporter asked, uh, do you have his phone number? As the journalist Mencken reminds us, never underestimate the ignorance of the American people. And we'll begin our topic with a discussion about Frederick Douglass, and he was a black abolition activist. After escaping slavery in Maryland, Frederick Douglass was a leader in the abolitionist community before, during, and after the Civil War. Not only was Frederick Douglass literate, he was an excellent writer, and he was an excellent speaker and he wrote several autobiographies of his life as a slave in his escape and many other works. And he was a spellbinding orator in an age where speakers were called on to deliver speeches that could last hours. And probably his most significant contribution to abolition was that he was living proof that black men, when educated, could match their white brothers in intellectual achievement. Professor Holloway's course opens with excerpts of a three-hour speech given by the freed slave and thundering orator Frederick Douglass on July 5, 1852, before the Civil War, to his abolitionist friends. He was invited but refused to speak on the July 4th holiday, arguing that for the Negro, July 4th was neither a holiday nor a day to remember freedom, since the great majority of Negroes were bound in chains as slaves regarded as nothing more than intelligent livestock, chattel property of their masters. Frederick Douglass starts the speech. Fellow citizens, pardon me and allow me to ask, why am I called upon to speak here today? What have I or those I represent to do with your national independence? Are the great principles of political freedom and natural justice embodied in the Declaration of Independence and extended to us? I, as a black man, am not included within the pale of this glorious anniversary. Your high independence only reveals the immeasurable distance between us. The blessings in which you this day rejoice are not enjoyed in common. The rich inheritance of justice, liberty, prosperity, and independence bequeathed by your fathers is shared by you, but not by me. The sunlight that brought life and healing to you has brought stripes and death to me. And the 4th of July is yours, not mine. You may rejoice, but I must mourn. To drag a man in fetters into the grand illuminated temple of liberty and call upon him to join you in joyous anthems is inhumane mockery and sacrilegious irony. Do you mean, citizens, to mock me by asking me to speak today? What to the American slave is your 4th of July? I answer, a day that reveals to him, more than all other days of the year, the gross injustice and cruelty to which he is the constant victim. To the slave, your celebration is a shame. Your boasted liberty is an unholy license. Your national greatness, swelling vanity. Your sounds of rejoicing are empty and heartless. Your denunciation of tyrants, brass-fronted impudence. Your shouts of liberty and equality, hollow mockery. 
your prayers and hymns, your sermons and thanksgiving, with all your religious parade and solemnity, are to him mere bombast, fraud, deception, impiety, and hypocrisy, a thin veil to cover up crimes which would disgrace a nation of savages. There is not a nation of the earth guilty of practices more shocking and bloody than are the people of these United States at this very hour. Now Americans had owned slaves in all 13 colonies in the Revolutionary War era and for many decades afterwards. But slavery was most cruel on the large plantations in the southern states where hundreds of slaves, anonymous as cattle herds, slaved in the fields. And Professor Holloway tells the little-known story of an obscure slave named John Jack. John Jack was captured and bound in chains in Africa and survived the Middle Passage on dark slave ships. As many as half of the slaves died during this journey to the Americas. He was fortunate to be purchased by a kind master who taught him a trade as a cobbler and allowed him to keep a small portion of his earnings, a privilege provided to a few slaves, mostly in the northern states. After many years, he purchased his freedom and bought a small subsistence farm, but although he was free and a property owner, he was still denied the right to vote. He was a second-class citizen and eventually drank himself to death in his misery. John Jack leaves the epitaph on his gravestone as a testimony to his life. God wills us free. Man wills us slave. I will as God wills. God's will be done. Here lies the body of John Jack, native of Africa, who died March 1773, aged about 60 years. Though buried in the land of slavery, he was born free. Though he lived in a land of liberty, he lived as a slave till by his honest though stolen labors he acquired the source of the slavery which gave him his freedom. Though not long before death, the grand tyrant gave him his final emancipation and finally set him on a footing with kings, because everyone dies. Though a slave to vice, he practiced those virtues without which kings are but slaves. And in his lecture, Professor Holloway displays images of Confederate script money. These scripts often have two motifs in common in Confederate mythology, and that is, one motif is the image of the happy black slave carrying bales of cotton, maybe singing at work, and the other motif is an image of an exalted white womanhood that deserves to be protected. Now, when Abraham Lincoln met Harriet Beecher Stowe, he remarked, so you are the little lady whose little book started the Civil War. And this book, Uncle Tom's Cabin, was the best-selling book by far in 1852, eventually selling over a million copies, which is massive in those days, galvanizing Northern opinion about the horrors of slavery. This romantic novel was written from the point of view of ordinary slaves, and it really promoted the concept that the lives of even slaves should have dignity. They were not just mere property like cows or horses that slaves could be the heroes and heroines of a tragic novel, allowing the reader to imagine the horrors of a life bound in chains, of souls bound in cruel inequities, of human beings bound in a life of unending cruelties. The moral antithesis of Uncle Tom's Cabin was the Supreme Court decision in Dred Scott v. Sanford in 1857. Dred Scott was a slave who sued his master for his freedom as his master moved him and his family between slave states and free states that banned slavery under the Missouri Compromise Law. The Southern Chief Justice Roger Tawney held that no Negro had ever enjoyed the rights of a citizen under the Constitution. Negroes were denied the dignity of personhood. Negroes were always property and would also remain property. Negroes were declared by the Supreme Court decision by Tawney to be so far inferior that they had no rights which a white man was bound to respect. This decision also claimed that Negroes have shown less capacity for government than any race of people, and that wherever they have been left to their own devices, they have shown a constant tendency to relapse into barbarism. This decision denied that the Constitution gave Congress the right to bar slavery in the territories. Chief Justice Taney and President Buchanan thought this decision would ease tensions both in the slaveholding South and in the country at large, but it enraged public opinion in the North, bolstering the popularity of Lincoln and the Republican Party. As an aside, during the Civil War, many of the Democratic justices in the Supreme Court resigned and went down South, but Roger Taney actually stayed and he passed away during the Civil War. However, Lincoln did not attend his funeral, but some of his cabinet did. In the years following the Civil War, the Lost Cause myth was promoted, the claim that the Civil War was fought over states' rights. 
and that the Civil War was not fought over slavery. Now, if this was true, somebody did not properly inform Alexander Stevens, the Vice President of the Confederacy, about the aims of the Civil War. During secession and the forming of the Confederacy, Alexander Stevens, a Georgian a slaveholder, and who was also an old friend and colleague of Abraham Lincoln's, proclaimed in this cornerstone speech in 1861, and this was on the eve of the secession. As a race, the African is inferior to the white man. Subordination to the white man is his normal condition. He is not his equal by nature and cannot be made so by human laws or human institutions. Our system, therefore, so far regards this inferior race, rests upon this great immutable law of nature. And to alleviate any doubts as to whether or not the war was about slavery, he says this in that speech. The new constitution, the Confederate Constitution, has put at rest forever all the agitating questions relating to our peculiar institution, Africa slavery as it exists among us and the proper status of the Negro in our form of civilization. In the years before the Civil War, the frontier cotton plantations in Alabama and Mississippi were the most prosperous. Many slaves were sold from the older colonies to these new plantations. Between 1820 and 1860, slaves born to slaves in the upper southern seaboard regions, like Virginia, Maryland in particular, had a 30% chance of being sold without their parents before they reached the age of 10 and Frederick Douglass was enslaved in this region, so he confirms this. And from David Blight's lecture, it's amazing to read the letters in the language of slave traders when they write to each other. The complacency, the mixture of just pure racism on the one hand, and just business language on the other. And this is from his research on some of the ordinary communications of the day. This is a slave trader said this, I refused a girl, 20 years old, at $700 yesterday, one trader wrote to another in 1853. If you think best to take her at 700, I can still get her. She is very badly whipped, but still has good teeth. So I guess the cruel master didn't break her teeth out of her jaw. And another trader wrote another, bought a cook yesterday. She was about to go out of the state. She just made the people mad, that was all. And another note, I have just bought a boy named Isaac, wrote another trader in 1854, for $1,100. I think him very prime. He is a house servant. First-rate cook and splendid carriage driver. He is also a fine painter and varnisher and says he can make a fine panel door. Also, he performs well on the violin. He is a genius. And strange to say, I think he's smarter than I am. Now, in 1860, Abraham Lincoln was elected president. But in 1859, the self-designated savior of the slaves, John Brown, organizes a small band of blacks and whites that captures the federal arsenal at Harper's Ferry in Virginia. The abolitionist Frederick Douglass told him he was crazy. The abolitionist Harry Tubman, an underground railroadman, thought he was crazy. John Brown didn't have much of a plan. After he seized the weapons in the arsenal, he had no way to spread the news of the slave rebellion to the slaves in the surrounding plantations. And how many would swarm to the arsenal anyway? U.S. Army Colonel Robert E. Lee easily put down the rebellion. And John Brown is wounded, but is allowed to deliver many long soliloquies during his trial, after which he is hanged. John Brown was a martyr. To this day, there are many blacks who think he was black. And sometimes you just can't budge some blacks from this unbelief. But he was the rare white martyr willing to sacrifice his life to attempt a black uprising. And of course, we're quoting from Professor Holloway. David Blight covers John Brown in several lectures. John Brown was a troubled man. He was a morbid man. He was an Old Testament man. But he probably was not crazy, as so many people said at the time. And people have said ever since. His altruism on behalf of the black people was not utterly selfish, but he was an extraordinary example of an American, a white American, who put his money where his mouth was, and he didn't have any money, so instead he put his life where his mouth was and took it into the South. Now he was executed, hung out in the field outside of Charleston, guarded by some 3,000 American troops, because there were all kinds of fears of attempts to break him out and seize him by northern Yankee bands. These, there were all kinds of threats. And looking at the painting, when he's being marched to his execution, he stops to kiss the cheek of a little slave child. And this sort of mixing of the races would have been unthinkable back in the day. David Blight continues, John Brown was the South's oldest, greatest, worst fear. 
an abolitionist from the north with a band of men and a bunch of weapons invading the south and trying to incite slave insurrection. They've been kind of predicting this all along and lo and behold it happened. In a trunk of stuff back at the farm in Maryland that he had rented for several months where his men had gathered, after his capture was found a whole sash of letters and maps. The old man had kept all kinds of maps in the south. He had maps of sections of Georgia and Alabama and even X certain towns on the maps. And David Black continues, When these southern maps were found and the press got hold of these all over the south, these stories spread and local newspapers would print stories about the maps of their county or their section of the state. This caused hysteria. Northern teachers working in the south were tarred and feathered. An itinerant piano tuner was lynched because he was from Massachusetts. Fear set in all across the South that there were going to be other abolitionist emissaries, and that was always the term used. And there were predictions and threats of all kinds, especially in South Carolina. John Brown, when he, and he certainly did read some of the papers, must have smiled at this. And the picture is a capture of Nat Turner, who led an unsuccessful slave rebellion in 1831. Because Nat Turner had been literate and well-educated and was a preacher, Southern slaveholders persuaded state legislatures across the South to make educating black slaves a crime, subject for punishment, lest their education would lead them to long for freedom. Uh, the next year, in 1860, at the Democratic National Convention, the Democratic Party split into a Southern and Northern wing over the issue of slavery. In addition to these two parties and the Republican Party, there was also a Constitutional Union Party of the border states. In the national elections, Abraham Lincoln won the majority of the votes in the Electoral College. Although since there were four parties in that pivotal year, Lincoln did not win a majority of the popular vote. But several southern states started seceding before Lincoln was inaugurated and the Civil War had begun. Now we'll discuss the sources we use for this video. Jonathan Holloway was a Yale professor whose chosen academic field is black history a topic he chose as a teenager, and these are his undergraduate lectures on African American history. And you can see from the list of the courses, the first six courses are about the history of slavery, the Civil War, and Reconstruction, because his histories center on civil rights and they go up to the present day. And Professor David Blight's lectures on the Civil War and Reconstruction from 1845 to 1877 have a different perspective. He gives us more background on Southern culture for the first few lectures. And if you think that the lectures are kind of slow, be patient because the following history lectures quickly pick up pace. And he covers many topics more important for American history, like the pre-Civil War history of the Polk administration, the acquisition of Texas and California, the Mexican War, uh, Henry Clay and the Compromise of 1850, and how the Republican Party formed from the ashes of the Whig, Free Labor, and other parties. Important prehistory for the Civil War. In addition to the slave narrative of Frederick Douglass, we have also cut videos on the lives of the former slaves Booker T. Washington and Father Augustine Tolton. And Booker T. Washington was a second generation of black leaders. He was freed as a teenager at the end of the Civil War. Booker T. Washington founded the Tuskegee Institute and nurtured black colleges in the worst of the KKK Jim Crow years of Reconstruction and Redemption. Father Augustine Tolton was also freed as a young man during the Civil War. Although he was illiterate, he learned to read and write in English, German, Greek, and Latin, and was the first ex-slave to be ordained a Jesuit priest in the Catholic Church. W.E.B. Du Bois was born free in Massachusetts and was the third generation of black leaders. He was the co-founder of the NAACP and wrote the famous history, Black Reconstruction, documenting the pivotal role blacks played in the Civil War and Reconstruction. And these are the two paintings used for a thumbnail. We have the lost cause of the bucolic depiction of happy slaves at work. And this is overwhelmed by the righteous indignation and rebellion caused by the fiery John Brown, who helped spark the Civil War with his unsuccessful raid on the federal arsenal at Harper's Ferry. The YouTube description links to the video script and our blog. Please support our channel by sharing this video with your friends and by clicking on the like and subscribe buttons and by clicking on the Amazon links to purchase any of the books we discussed, which will earn us a small affiliate commission. And please consider becoming a patron of our channel. And please click on the links for interesting videos on other topics that will broaden your knowledge and improve your soul. Thank you.